I remember the first uh, contact I had with a 70 millimeter or 65 millimeter was um, uh, when I saw Lawrence of Arabia, uh, a 70 millimeter print, and it just, I had never seen anything like that before. It just absolutely blew me away. <laughs> seeing a, a David Lynch's eraser head um, at the age of 12 <laughs> and um, I was absolutely blown away I mean I was 12 I was a kid I had never seen anything like it and it appealed to me both in terms of the art house aspect and also the horror aspect and um, after that I sort of uh, went on into this onto this uh, journey of just trying to discover as many movies as I could and uh, and I obviously discovered classics like uh, Friday the 13th and uh, other other more artistic films um, or more more art house driven films uh, like David Lynch's movie or uh, or Tarkovsky or uh, Lars von Trier, um, and um, I think uh, I think um, I think what I'm trying to do personally is combine sort of both aesthetics, is make something that's very art house driven, but also has classic uh, uh, horror elements. Um, horror, I think, appeals to me uh, uh, on a very visceral and uh, visual level, actually. Um, I think there's something very powerful about about uh, locations in horror movies. Uh, there's, uh, for instance, uh, uh, a very, very vi visual uh, impressions like an old house or a cemetery or, or the, the deep of the forest. And um, I think that's something that's especially powerful in, in, in horror movies uh, where the location really is the horror. Um, and uh, you, can change, uh, you can change everything in a movie based on what location you choose uh, and uh, how you, and you, you can speak to the audience with that. So that's actually what I do first when I, uh, when I, uh, when I try to produce a new movie. I, I write down what kind of location I want and how I want the locations to look like um, and uh, and uh, I think that's something that appeals to me very much are the just simply the visuals um, and especially especially from uh, I especially enjoy horror movies from 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 the 80s and 90s because it was a uh, um, obviously they were all shot on film um, and there was a very distinct aesthetic there were they used a lot of fog like there was a, a pretty much an overabundance of fog in those movies and I I think it's great I think it, it works uh, visually and it, it appeals to people I think people just like seeing things that look visually appealing and um, I think it, it's, it's sort of gotten lost a little in recent years with horror a lot of horror films that came out have been looking very sterile and very clean um, and with um, more more focused on telling the actual story, which is obviously also a very important part. But I think what really appeals to me about horror are the classic horror images, like crosses and uh, churches and um, uh, woods and cemeteries, all those kinds of things. What is Daughter of Dismay about? Um, Daughter of Dismay is a very simple story that's um, that's uh, also uh, very visually driven because that's what what I was focusing on. Um, it's basically about a. Uh, I'm not. I'm going to try to explain this in a way that I'm not going to spoil something because obviously during half of the film, there's sort of a, a progression that that leads to something that I, I can't mention because I don't want to ruin it. But it's basically about a broken witch, uh, a, a witch uh, who's a very broken uh, uh, a sad character because she went through some very intense trauma um, and she lost her daughter uh, and is trying to, to uh, is going through very extreme measures to get her to get her daughter back to life I um, mean it's uh, it's uh, I wanted to do something uh, I wanted to create a, a, an occult story with a witch that's not uh, the the usual cliched Hollywood witch with like w w it's just all about devil worship and all about the evil woman. Uh, I wanted to create sort of a human character that you can feel for that's not uh, that's 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 not completely supernatural. That's still ominous and uh, and scary, but not um, that you don't that you don't want to hate. I wanted to create a character that you that you feel for and that you that you actually root for um, and. Um, and I think th what Daughter of Dismay is really about is, is loss and grief uh, and, uh, and how we process it. Um, and uh, also it's also about motherhood and the relation between, uh, between the bond between a mother and a daughter and what lengths people would go through uh, for their children. Um, and it's basically all packed in this occult, uh, in this occult visual story that is really uh, pretty much entirely about the atmosphere and the, this whole feeling of... Uh, of uh, of ominous, um, of ominous happenings. I started shooting film uh, uh, a couple of years ago. I haven't actually been making films for that long. Um, I think it's been like three years now. Um, and around, uh, after a year of filmmaking, uh, 
I, uh, I actually got the chance to shoot a feature film in Super 8 and 16 millimeter, which was absolutely phenomenal. Like it was a, it was an experimental film, and it was just great getting to experiment. I um, mean, it was always very drawn to, uh, to the film aesthetics before that. Um, like the, the, I've only ever made one short that was digital or one film in general, and uh, we were trying to go for a film look, even if though it was shot digitally, it was grainy, uh, scratchy, 16 millimeter look. Um, and I think what appeals to me so much about film in general is is this organic quality and this like this lifelike almost uh, 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 rendering of colors um, and how it how how it uh, how your eye perceives it. There's something very different about looking at a film at a film that was shot on celluloid than uh, uh, versus a film that was shot digital. Um, uh, because obviously with 70 millimeter prints, there's, there's a, especially if they're done photochemically, which we did with this film, um, there's just such an absolutely insane, like this almost like hyper realism, this hyper clarity, um, where it's almost sharper than real life. And it, uh, it's almost like when you look at a film projected in a 70 millimeter, it's almost like you see more than you would see in real life. Um, and uh, there was, it's just a different way of seeing movies. And I mean, for, I think everyone who's seen 70 millimeter prints can agree that once you've seen that, you just like, you want to keep experiencing that. It's not, it's not just sitting in a theater and watching something, it's like actually experiencing it. Um, and um, I think that appealed to me very much about 70 millimeter and 65 millimeter filmmaking. Um, and uh, so we were trying very, very hard to make it happen with this film. Uh, and we were actually very lucky because initially we were planning on shooting it in an anamorphic uh, 35 millimeter um, simply due to budget reasons. Um, but uh, I, uh, I, uh, I realized very soon that this was something, this was a movie that needed to be in this format because it just, I did not want, I did not want grain. I did not want a single bit of uh, softness to the image. I just wanted this absolute, uh, almost three dimensional quality that 70 millimeter has. And um, unfortunately, we actually ended up uh, going even further than that, making IMAX, uh, making an IMAX uh, uh, production out of this. Um, we didn't shoot it in IMAX, we shot it in 8 perf, uh, seven, uh, 65 millimeter, and ended up doing 70 millimeter IMAX prints. Um, and it was, a, it was just the whole experience of going through that was absolutely phenomenal. And uh, uh, just now seeing it uh, as intended in 70 millimeter just confirmed why I wanted to shoot in this format. It's just, it's a, uh, uh, it's, they call a 70 millimeter IMAX immersive, an immersive film experience. And I think even with regular five perf 70 millimeter, it's very, very much an immersive experience. We're almost being placed in the, in the movie. And you sort of forget that you're watching a movie just because of how your eyes perceive the visuals because it's, it's a very direct way of seeing something. It's like, it's, yeah, it's a, there's this interesting uh, phenomenon for me about 70 millimeter where you literally see more than in real life. Um, and uh, having been on set of the film, I can confirm that that's very true because you just see things that you, that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. I remember the, in the last shot of the movie, which I'm not gonna spoil, but there's trees in the film and I have never realized until now that there are red berries on the trees. And they're obviously a tiny detail, but you see them very vividly. Um, and that's absolutely what appeals to me about uh, 70, 65 millimeter and uh, why I shot in it. We used to, uh, 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 Fries Mitchell, uh, 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 eight par 65 millimeter camera, it's literally just what it's called. Uh, and I think the specific one we use, there aren't that many uh, in existence, which is the case with most of these cameras. Um, also, I, I, IMAX cameras, for instance, I think there's only around four or four or five of them and Christopher Nolan wrecked one of them. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but, and also with the Aeroflex, the, the five par of Aeroflex uh, that we uh, were initially gonna use, they're also only at around three. Um, and it was the same with this camera. So they're, they're really hard to come by um, and to actually get. Um, and like even when you go to a, to a rental house and try to rent a, a 65 millimeter camera, they, they, make, you, they, they, they make you answer an absolute ton of questions before just to make sure that you're actually qualified to do so. And we had the, yeah, we had the, um, we had the luck of, uh, of uh, having uh, someone contact our cinematographer. Uh, they, I think they knew each other. I'm not 100% sure, but he's an IMAX filmmaker, not our cinematographer, but the guy who rented us the camera. And um, he, um, he offered us to, to, to rent this camera to us uh, so, we could, uh, so we could have uh, uh, 15 perf prints made because the aspect ratio of eight perf and 15 perf is, a perf is actually almost identical. Um, which makes it easy to blow it up. Um, and the cool thing about that is uh, we were thinking about shooting 15 perf too, but that would have just added so much to the cost. Uh, 
uh, because at 65 millimeter film, I mean, you're already at around 800 euros just for the raw stock per roll. Um, and uh, and uh, f uh, if you shoot 15 perf, you have, with a 500 foot roll, you have a minute of film. Um, and that was uh, not very feasible for us. And uh, we talked to Photochem, uh, who uh, did our film prints, and they actually uh, they said it's pretty much there's pretty much no visual difference between a 15 perf film and one that's ha that's been shot on 8 perf and blown up to 15 perf. So um, that was the whole process with the camera. <laughs> It was difficult getting film stock. Um, I think uh, it was actually f usually uh, this is a this is um, this is not that big of an issue. What you usually do is you just contact Kodak because usually when you shoot something in 65 millimeter, they're very happy to provide 65 millimeter film. Um, it's very expensive through Kodak directly unless you uh, you get uh, uh, recans or uh, or short ends, uh, which basically means f leftover film from other productions. In this case, we were fortunate because some Hollywood production had just finished their 65 millimeter film, uh, and uh, they uh, they had a lot of leftover uh, uh, rolls that were not even opened. Um, so they they sent it to a to a company called Frame 24 uh, in uh, in the in London, I think. Um, and um, they, they resold them for a lot cheaper, which was great for us because it was fresh, unused film that was literally sealed, and uh, we were able to get it for half the price. Um, so that we were very lucky on that, which and that just enabled us to shoot more rolls um, because otherwise it's just obviously 65 millimeter is the most expensive thing you could shoot in. So we were very fortunate uh, to, to be able to do that. How did I find my cinematographer? Um, uh, that w at one point we just we announced online that we were that we s we were switching to 65 millimeter, um, and th we were one of the only short films who's actually ever done that. Um, there aren't that many 65 millimeter shorts, and uh, most of the ones that exist are documentaries. Um, so it was pretty much one of the. It was the first narrative short to utilize 70 millimeter IMAX. And I remember um, we we were not in, uh, involved with IMAX at that point, but. Uh, um, Ben, our cinematographer, actually sent me an email uh, out of nowhere, um, and he told me about his work. He sent me some of his short films, and he basically asked me uh, if we needed a, a camera assistant by any chance. And it was like, actually, we need a cinematographer. Um, <laughs> so he was uh, he was extremely excited to be on board, and uh, we uh, I remember uh, I remember the first time uh, I, I called him. We literally talked for four hours about about analog filmmaking, and I absolutely knew that he was perfect for 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 the part. Uh, so um, it just it just continued from there and uh, he ended up making a lot of uh, great things possible for us and he provided a lot of great crew too. He's a very experienced cinematographer um, who's uh, shot in VistaVision before. He's uh, He created a, a short film shot in VistaVision that he actually projected in VistaVision which I don't think anyone has done in decades. Um, so yeah, I, I just after hearing all his stories, how he literally contacted the creator of the VistaVision cameras, um, uh, I, I knew that he was passionate enough to, <laughs> to, to be on board of this. We shot the film in in the deep of the woods in in uh, in, uh, in Austria, um, uh, close to a city called Linz. Uh, which is uh, we were around 20 minutes out of the city. Interesting thing is, I actually uh, the, the the that's the forest I grew up around. Um, uh, I I live like two minutes away from the from the forest. It's in, right in front of my house, and the we went we were a little deeper in, so we had to uh, we had to actually drive there with our with the, with with trucks and cars and uh and have have us park on a big pasture so we could get into the woods from the back side. Um, but it's uh it's just a, a random patch of woods in Austria. Of, Obviously, there's a lot of forests in Austria, and um, that specific forest just absolutely mesmerized me. Just I, I've I've grown up there, and it's a very fairy tale like forest. There's a a lot of fallen over trees and uh, dead dead trees and branches just hanging down, and big bushes and just a lot of weed. Um, and it's a um, it's a very visually vi visually impressive uh, piece of nature. I um, mean, I've always wanted to shoot an epic there, a very epic. Uh, 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 experience that that would really immerse people into this forest, um, and I think that the, w what I really wanted to do with this film is make the forest the main character, um, and uh, because there's only really uh, uh, three characters and three actors in the movie, and I wanted the forest sort of to be the main character and really drive the film, um, and yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's called uh, Kuhnberger Wald, uh, Kuhnberger Forest, uh, uh, around 20 minutes away from Linz. <laughs>
we didn't actually use a digital intermediate. We had um, uh, we had a, a 4K scan of the dailies made uh, of all the of all the negative uh, of all the negatives, and uh, we we had we assembled a, a digital cut from the 4K uh, uh, files. Um, and they were uh, they were uh, uh, DPX files, which means they are completely uncompressed. It was literally 2.5 terabytes of uh, of footage, um, uh, which took three days to download. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, we did not have any digital steps in between. Only the cutting was done digital, but uh, but uh, but the 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 final prints were made directly from the original negative. Um, Without any digital steps between, because that's really what I wanted to do. Because uh, as uh, as convenient as doing a 4K uh, uh, inter or even an 8K intermediate is, it's just it's still a digital step, um, and it just looks different if you actually print from original film. I um, mean, I really wanted to to have that experience, and also it's actually cheaper to do photochemical prints um, because recording uh, recording out a digital file is actually about three times as expensive. Um, so that ended up saving us money even though it, it obviously uh, um, it obviously took longer because it's there's the process of cutting the cutting the negative and uh, and having answer prints made and color timing and all that those sorts of things um, but it absolutely paid off I mean you don't get that kind of quality from a digital file um, and I, I mean I just saw once upon a time in Hollywood uh, in 70 millimeter and it was shot in 35 um, and it was of um, uh, the guys at Photochem uh, who did our prints did that film, and they told me it was from a 4K uh, digital intermediate. And I thought it, was, it looked great, but it just did not have that hyper clarity that uh, that you get from photochemical prints. And I really, really wanted this to look as good as possible and have all the 70 millimeter qualities that I love. Um, so yeah, there was no uh, digital step between. We all uh, we did it all photochemically. We were very fortunate to work with uh, with uh, one of Hollywood's leading uh, composers uh, in his genre. Uh, his name is uh, Joseph Bashara. Um, he uh, he did the score on uh, uh, Annabelle and Insidious and The Conjuring, basically all the major Hollywood horror films that came out in the recent years. Um, and he keeps doing it. He keeps scoring. <laughs> he keeps getting. He keeps getting really, really, uh, really great gigs. Um, and he's uh, he's uh, he was he was my first pick of choice. Um, I, uh, I I remember seeing Insidious, and um, uh, there was something. Uh, it was it was obviously a, a very very uh, very um, general Hollywood horror movie. But I, what I enjoyed so much about it was how visceral uh, and and genuinely creepy it was. And um, there was something about the atmosphere that uh, that really actually made me feel uncomfortable, which not a lot of horror films actually do. Because uh, what he does is he works with violins a lot and with uh, strings. Um, and he knows how to create a dissonance. Uh, I was so blown away by by his techniques, where he would, uh, where for instance, what he did, uh, well, one of the things he did in that movie was uh, um, uh, uh, hit the strings of a broken piano uh, with a metal pipe or something to create this dissonant, uh, this almost almost disturbing sound. Um, and um, I, uh, I I saw some. I've, I watched a bunch of more movies that he scored, um, and um, and uh, I realized that he had very great capabilities to make something very dramatic too, and, uh, and very emotional. Um, um, so uh, he was my first, my first choice, uh, and uh, I emailed his agent, um, and they, he got back to me, and uh, and uh, uh, Joe read the the script, and he loved it. Um, so he ended up being on board, uh, which was great uh, because you don't usually immediately get the first person you want to have, uh, but yeah, that fortunately worked out, and he did an amazing job. I mean, um, I. Uh, uh, we had a very, very long discussion about where I wanted parts uh, 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 very specifically and w what he should do. And he, I mean, he masterfully pulled it off. I think the music is definitely one of the strongest points about the film. And yeah, we were very lucky with that. Uh, on top of having an absolutely amazing sound engineer uh, who made it sound even better, Steve Maslow, who actually weirdly, uh, <laughs> who actually weirdly uh, 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 mixed Dune. Um, but yeah, he's uh, he's a genius. I mean, he's he's the he's the leading sound technician in Hollywood. He did pretty much every film you could think of on the top of your head. Like he did the Raiders of the Lost Ark and The Empire Strikes Back. He did Edward Scissorhands. He did John Carpenter's The Thing. He did uh, he did uh, Beetlejuice. Just pretty much anything you could think of. Um, and uh, he's uh, he's really incredible. He's he's a very old school guy. He uh, he does things. He likes to do things like he did it. Uh, uh, in the older years, and it just, he's, he absolutely, it was a pleasure working with him. He made it sound absolutely great. 
Um, so we were very lucky with that too. I really just found his email address and sent him an email and he was like, and he replied like half an hour, half an hour later, he was like, hey, can I call you real quick? I'm very interested. Um, so we ended up talking and he was immediately on board, um, especially since he worked with Bashara already with our composer, he, he'd worked with him already. So that was great too. They, uh, they were happy to work together again. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't actually hard getting in touch with him at all. Uh, he was actually the easiest person to get in touch with because he didn't even have an agent. I just found his email address, which usually doesn't happen. Because <laughs> you usually have to get through a wall of people before you can get to a person. But um, that, yeah, that ended up working, working out great. We're actually screening this film in pretty much every single format there is. Uh, we have... Uh, I'm going to start low. We have uh, 2K DCPs, which just have a regular 2K digital version. We have a 4K digital version. Uh, we have uh, a Dolby Atmos version, which is digital, obviously. Um, we, have, uh, we have a 35 millimeter version. We have a digital IMAX version in 4K. Um, we have a, a set 5 perf 70 millimeter version and, uh, and 70 millimeter IMAX prints. Um, so we actually, were, I think we're, there's not one format that we're not covering. Which is cool because all of those formats, um, uh, seeing the film in all of those formats, if you, I, I've obviously seen it in all of them, um, and it's a, it's a different film in every format. It's just uh, very interesting to create a film that's actually different films if you see it in a different format. For instance, I mean, the 70 millimeter IMAX version is completely different from the Dolby Atmos version. Um, and it's just all, it's, it's very interesting how you can play with, uh, with different elements and just create a very faceted. Uh, 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 Experience, and that was one of the one of the things I was excited about um, is just getting getting this uh, getting this into the world, but offering so many ways of seeing it. Comparing the different sound mixes, we we have a lot of different sound mixes. We have a five five point one version, which is the seventy millimeter version. We have a seven point one. Uh, we have a, 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 a IMAX version, which is IMAX has its own sound system, and it's a basically a six track. Uh, well, actually, the digital the digital IMAX uses a different sound system entirely. They have a five track uh, a five track IMAX uh, sound system, and the 70 millimeter version has a six track sound system. And uh, it's actually 6.0, which means uh, every single every single one of the speakers acts as their own subwoofer, which gives you very rich. Uh, low frequencies, and um, I think the, the the biggest difference between Dolby Atmos and the 5.1, if you would compare them, uh, is I, I think it's um. I, I, I prefer, I will always prefer the 70 millimeter version, even with the 5.1 track, because it still sounds very impressive. It still sounds very big. Um, but what I really love about the uh, Atmos version that this version doesn't have is this absolute immersive feeling um, where you can, a lot of, there's a lot of foreshadowing just through sounds in the, in the, in the Dolby Atmos version. Like um, at the, in the, one of the opening shots where the witch appears from behind the tree, uh, you just see the tree for, for, uh, for the first couple of seconds. But in the Atmos version, you can hear her, uh, you can hear her steps from behind you, and you can sort of guess where she's coming from. Um, and the wind sort of blows around you, and the leaves, um, and also the demonic vis whispering and voices um, are very—they're sort of swooshing around, and uh, uh, and it's a very—it's a very interesting experience. Um, obviously, uh, Dolby Atmos is mostly 2K, uh, 2K uh, digital. I think they have 4K versions now too, but uh, we, I'm I'm not 100% sure. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely an in interesting comparing those two. Um, even though I will always prefer the 70 millimeter version, even with the 5.1 uh, track, because it's, it's still surround sound and it still sounds great. I think the toughest the toughest challenge with this project uh, was uh, that's a I think there were so many challenges. Uh, it was uh, I mean it was pretty much impossible to pull this off. I think um, I think what was what was really hard was just the actual shoot itself. Um, because shooting in a format like this, you have to restrict yourself to uh, only a couple of takes per shot. Um, and it also started raining, and we literally could not add another day because it would have uh, it would have added half of the budget. Uh, it would have, I mean, uh, that would have just not been uh, uh, financially feasible. The toughest thing was shooting it and making sure that uh, that every single shot works and that we actually got all the scenes because we had to cut three shots that uh, ended up not being the most important ones. But um, but uh, after it started raining and we lost two hours, our production manager came up to me and she, she told me we had to cut another two shots, otherwise we wouldn't make it. I told her it's not, it's not gonna happen. Like I'm, I, I have to shoot those two shots, otherwise the film makes no sense because we were cutting down on it so much already. Um, so that was a big challenge that I, I mean, I had an absolute panic attack on set because uh, uh, if, uh, if, we, if we would have lost those two shots, we would have 
thrown hundreds of thousands of uh, of euros in the in the dirt. I mean, it would have not happened. Um, so, and we literally the last very last shot we finished when the sun was going down. Um, so, we were fortunate enough to make it happen. Uh, but yeah, that was uh, I think shooting was the biggest challenge. Post production was pretty pretty easy because we uh, we just took really took time and it didn't set myself any deadlines. Uh, uh, so the post production itself took an entire year. Um, and I think really those two shooting days that was the m most stressful thing I've ever done. <laughs> so yeah, that was definitely a big challenge. Financing uh, anything is usually the root. That's usually the really hard part. Um, so how do you find? How did I finance this? Um, well, at first we started. Um, we started contacting random producers, um, and uh, and uh, we we uh, we had a deal where you could um, where you could purchase uh, uh, titles. Like for instance, you could purchase purchase a co-producer title. Um, so people would uh, people people uh, outside of the movie industry would um, would, uh, would 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 would. Uh, give us some money to to if uh, people who were very excited about actually seeing it. Um, and fortunately, in the end, uh, I mean that just it didn't add up. Like it, the movie was so expensive uh, with a budget. It's a short film, and the budget was two hundred thousand. Um, and uh, 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 we had to we had to we had to just like ver dig really deep, and we ended up finding a private investor who was very uh, uh, sold on uh, on having the movie made. Um, and uh, we ended up spending way more than we should have, but uh, he was very uh, he was very very uh, supportive, and uh, he made the movie happen. And he's someone I actually know, uh, which ended up being great. Um, so yeah, I'm very thankful to him. Uh, we also had a, a producer uh, who who uh, who paid for some of it. So it was a collection of different people chipping in and trying to make it happen. Because um yeah I mean this is a budget that you would usually work in with a with a studio I mean if you if you try to 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 sort of divide it and calculate it out to a feature it would be around four million for for a, it would be around a four million feature um, so that was a that was definitely a big challenge too trying to actually make this happen um, so yeah uh, I think what really helped is just me being persistent and never mentioning money once to any of the crew uh, which is why we got all these people and once we got all these famous people and all these like great great artists uh, uh, that just enabled us to actually get the money so I think that was the trick was uh, just being a little uh, sketchy with it <laughs> and trying to get everyone on board before we actually fund it uh, uh, because that enabled us to actually find someone who's really interested in it. So what do theaters uh, have to do to screen the film? Uh, you really just have to. You really just have to contact either me or our producer, um, and uh, uh, we have a we have a website. Or uh, I, I'm working as a production collective. It's not a, not a direct company, but it's sort of our production collective. It's called a uh, Sodom and Chimera Productions, um, uh, and uh, uh, our website is sodomchimera.com. And uh, I I can I've, I can uh, if uh, if if someone really wants to screen this, I think the best way to go is to go ahead and uh, send me a, an email. Uh, because I'm uh, I'm taking care of a lot of it, or producer is too. But it's probably the best to just contact me directly.